Liz Guillonet about the all order asymptotic expansion in beta ensemble, which is a special case of random matrices, say random matrix model, and uh, especially in the multi cut regime. So I will first explain what is the model and try to state the results, and also will say what's the history of those results, and then describe an application of that to a case where the model is exactly solvable, but we do not use that it's exactly solvable. We rather use this kind of results to obtain results on some exactly solvable model. So it's uh, an application to a computation of asymptotic expansion of orthogonal polynomials and of the TODA chain. And I will try to describe in the second part of the talk the, um, some ideas about the proof of those results. I will not do the full proof. And then try to discuss some generalization of this. So the beta ensemble is a, uh, you have n particles on the real line, the position I denote lambda i, and um, they undergo some Coulomb repulsion. Um, and they are trapped in some potential v. So here, for me, beta is a positive parameter. It plays a role the inverse temperature in the model. And um, a is some set, subset of the real line. So very soon we will take a compact, because for a reason I will explain. So this type of problem appears because in random matrix theory because if you take a random matrix with this distribution, and if you take a Hermitian matrix, this is a distribution induced on eigenvalues of this random matrix for beta equals 2. And if you do that also for real symmetric matrices or real quaternion uh, itself dual matrices, then you would end up with the same type of uh, distribution on the eigenvalues with some other exponent repulsion beta, 1 and 4. And in general, this is not for other values of beta related to, uh, I would say, a random matrix ensemble. Or, uh, let's say that uh, a random matrix belonging to some vector space and distribution invariant under some symmetry group. That's not the case for other values of beta. Uh, it has still been found that there's a representation where you have M to the three diagonal matrix, matrix by Dumetun and Edelman, whose eigenvalues, if you choose well the distribution of the entries, are indeed distributed like this. So, this is a special kind of random matrix. So I just want to study that as a system of statical mechanics problem. Also related to the to the what? The model. Yes, sure. Yeah, for sure. So um, the question I want to ask about this model. Uh, is when n, the number of particles, is large, what kind of random variable, I mean, random kind of random measure is this empirical measure, right? But the way it's 1 over n in direct masses, all the lambda i's. And the second question I want to ask is, how does the partition function of that behave when n goes to infinity? So the first thing is a leading order, which is something very well known. Um, so under quite weak assumption on the potential, trapping potential v, and here we assume that it grows sufficiently at infinity so that um, it's confining. Everything happens in compact sense, basically, up to exponential small corrections. Uh, so under those, those assumptions, if you want to know what's the leading order of that, you need to know what kind of configuration of lambda i maximized this measure. And instead of maximizing over the set of um, empirical measures, which are uh, the sum of n Dirac masses, you can try to say it will be, the answer will be very close to maximize that over the set of all probability measures. Um, so that's what this functional does. So this way is basically exponential of beta over 2 times n squared times this functional. And you end up with, to answer the question, what are the configurations maximizing that over the space of probability measures? And it turns out that this is a convex functional. Uh, well, actually, if I put a plus sign here, it's a concave functional. So it has a unique maximizer. And this maximizer can write on some Euler Lagrange equation, and this is a characterization of it. So it's um, a certain quantity here should be uh, equal to a constant on the support of the equilibrium measure, and it should be smaller else. So this function has a unique maximizer, which is called the equilibrium measure. And then the theorem is that the empirical measure converges in low, so converges in, expe sorry, in expectation and almost surely uh, to this equilibrium measure. And indeed, what you expect is true. The leading order of the partition function is indeed given by the value exponential of n squared i beta over 2, the value of this functional at the equilibrium measure, plus some small corrections. So this is a very well-known theorem of potential theory. Okay. 
So this quantity which appears here, so V of X minus this, is the effective potential. So if you come back to here, and you see, you look at one lambda i and try to look what, are, what is the potential felt effectively. If you do some mean field theory because you have all these lambda j interacting with lambda i, they should be distributed approximately like mu x. So these things here is the effective potential felt by one particle. And uh, the characterization of the equilibrium measure tells you that on the support, basically this effective potential should be constant. And away from it, it could be something else. So from there, you can prove some large deviation theorem. So I would call that local result because it tells the probability that there exists one of this lambda i, which is in some close subset of your initial render of integration. You can bound it by, by exponential of minus n beta over 2 and the minimum of the effective potential over this class set. So it tells you that if this is effective potential, if you are over here, the probability to have an eigen to have an eigenvalue here will be exponentially small. Okay. So in particular, you can restrict your range of integration up to exponentially small correction to B, which is around the region where this effective potential is at its minimum. Okay. So there is a second type of um, result you can prove a priori just by doing some probability, is what I call global large deviations. So you would like to know this empirical measure Ln, how far is it from the equilibrium measure mu x? Uh, so for that, you need the notion of distance. And there is the problem gives you a natural one, which is this uh, kind of logarithmic distance, which in Fourier transform can be just written like, uh, like this. So it's something which belongs to 0 plus infinity. Uh, so it's a pseudo distance on the set of probability measures. And if you want to compute the linear statistic and test it against the empirical measure and the difference uh, with the equilibrium measure, you can control that in terms of certain sub -OLF norm of the test function and this pseudo distance. Okay, so what we will state is a concentration result on this uh, on this distance. So first, because the measure the, this measure Ln is atomic, you would see that if you put it over here because of the log singularity, you would always get some infinite result. So you just need to regularize it a bit that uh, to avoid the singularity of the log. So in a deterministic way, if you know, and then you can associate some nice regularization which is not atomic and for which you can really compare this Ln tilde to mu x with this regressmic distance. And then the theorem is that for V, uh, oh, you need some smoothness assumption, so say T3, uh, the probability that the distance is bigger than T um, would be smaller than exponential of so you make some error, which is basically come from the regularization that you do, and you cannot avoid that. So C n log n minus n squared beta over 2 t squared. So this is interesting when t is of order um, log of uh, square root of log of n divided by n. So in this way, you have a kind of large deviation estimate on those, on those distances. Yes. So regularization just means that you would... Um, uh, basically separate the lambda i's enough if they were too close and then make a convolution with some uniform law of small support. Well, dependent on n. Dependent on n, yeah. So how, 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 how I mean, you, you have the choice in what you do. Uh, basically, I think it's 1 over n. You separate them by 1 over n squared, if I remember, and you convolve by something of order 1 over n cubed. So it, this does not matter much. Yeah, but it does not matter much. There's something you need to do, and you have some bond for the uh, signatures, but at the end, you always get this CN log, and it's more or less optimal <coughs> with this method. Okay. So um, this is for, I would say, the a priori results you have on your model. Uh, then I want to know more about the fluctuations of these empirical measures and uh, uh, finite size correction to this leading order. Uh, and for that, I need to discuss some property of the equilibrium measure. So um, the first thing you can prove is that if V is very analytic, which is the framework I will take for the remaining of the talk, um, then this equilibrium measure has a finite number um, of the support of this equilibrium measure has a finite number of connected components, which are the segments. So I denote G plus 1 the number of segments, or sometimes we call them cuts. So then there is a distinction between hard edge and soft edges. So you can prove that mu x is always this form. It will be like square root at some edges, which you call soft, 
maybe inverse of square root of some other edges. And in front of there, there is some real analytic function. Um, and that only, only assumption it, that it's non-negative on the support. Um, so you could be in a wildcat regime, for example, if your V was convex, you would always end up like this. Uh, or you could have some several cuts. And transition between them corresponds um, are done through critical points. So it means that if you want to go continuously to change the parameters of the potential V to go from there to there, you would have to split something. So you have to make appear some zeros in M, for example, or to split that in two, or to make appear some new cut over here. So it still corresponds to M having a zero somewhere else and then the cut growing. So the case I will consider is the off-critical case um, for some techni good technical reason. Uh, so we say that M is, um, mu hack is off critical when this M is always positive on all the range of integration. So it means that we prevent, we are not very close from new cuts to appear or from splitting to appear. So we do not describe the transition. Okay. So the assumption I will take to, for the results are the following. Uh, v could, um, so first it should be real analytic at leading order. But I also allow some complex uh, analytic uh, perturbation of order 1 over n. And it could even have some 1 over n expansion if you want. Uh, I will assume there is control of large deviation, which is that this effective potential, um, this cannot happen outside the support. That's what I ask to have this control of, to have this, um, this type of results. I will assume that mu x is off critical. And when I have a test function, I assume they're analytic. Okay, so the results, I will explain the result and then describe the history of those results. So in the one cut regime, uh, there is a one over an expansion, which is of this form. So there's some algebraic decay, which is universal gamma, and, sorry, gamma and gamma prime are universal exponent, depending only on beta and the nature of the edges. And the FKs here um, are some computable coefficient would depend on beta in a very simple way if the potential V was um, like this with this beta over two factorized. So there is a nice one over an expansion. And when you take a test function and compute this fluctuation of linear statistics, you find it's converted to some sun in low to some non-certain Gaussian variable. So there's central limit here. So now in the G plus one cut regime, the situation is different. So I will denote epsilon star. So you have this equilibrium measure. And um, I will call epsilon star the fraction of eigenvalue which live in each of those cuts. Um, so the result is of the form, again, we have this one over an expansion over here. And in front of that, you have some oscillatory term. So dn is a formal um, operator, uh, differential operator in one over n. And it acts on some theta function. So just to remind a theta function is just the sum over lattice, here is z to the g, of exponential of some quadratic form. So what do you put in theta? First, there is this characteristic, which is a shift of the lattice. You should take it to minus n epsilon star mod zg. So epsilon star is given by the equilibrium measure here. And just multiply by n. So this is basically the expected number of eigenvalues in each well. But this is mod zg, because this function is, a peri is zg periodic in mu, because you're summing over the lattice. So it means that here, this theta function with this mu is something pseudo-periodic in n, or maybe periodic if this is a vector of rational numbers. OK. And what you do with that, uh, inside, well, you evaluate it to some arguments. So q is some negative definite uh, g times g matrix. And W, um, well, it should be evaluated to some coefficient, which is computable again. So this Q depends on beta in a very simple way, just proportional to beta or two, and times a period matrix of some compact Riemann surface. So you have some oscillatory asymptotics. If I take the simplest case of uh, a two-cut situation, which is symmetric, where you have, say, one half of the eigenvalue over here and one half over here, um, this, so here G equals 1, we're in a two-cut situation. So it's an elliptic theta, Jacobi theta function. And here, this mu should be equal to 0 or 1 half. 
So you see a certain one over an expansion, uh, including those correlation just are constant if n is odd, and you see a different one over an expansion if n is even. So in general, there's some pseudo periodic behavior. Okay. So let me see. Let me go back to that slide. So your Q is the uh, what is it? It's the, it's the Hessian of the. So Q is the Hessian of the. So I should say with respect to which variable, and I will say that later. Okay. So there is this energy but functional. But have you defined the f before? Where is the f? No, I just say there exist coefficients, okay. and. I claim that they are computable, but I will not uh, state what are the formulas now. So that was for the asymptotics of the partition function. Now, uh, for the, if you want to know what type of fluctuation of linear statistics are, uh, in general, there is no central limit theorem. So if you compute the Fourier transform expectation value of this exponential of is and these fluctuations, uh, when n goes to infinity, you can study asymptotically what it means, what it is, you find x something which is quadratic, so that's typically of a, Gaussian, a trace of a Gaussian, but also some correction with a theta. And if you want to interpret that, this is a Fourier transform of a Gaussian variable, and this is a Fourier transform of what I will call a discrete Gaussian, which is a Gaussian variable that you sample on a lattice, so at different integer points, and the center is precisely mu. So if you want, uh, here you have this variable is a Gaussian variable plus a discrete Gaussian, but its center is fluctuating very quickly. And that's why it destroys, in general, the central limit here. But if you take um, subsequences of n so that this converges mod zg, then you end up with this um, convergence in low to Gaussian plus discrete Gaussian of a fixed center. I should also say that uh, if you, so the step of this at which you sample, uh, so it's some g-dimensional vector, which is proportional to some integral of the test function over the support. So this is just um, saying that there is a dimension g space uh, for which you do not have a central limit theorem. But in the case where f, those integrals are all zero, then you do have a central limit theorem because v is equal to zero and this cancel. They're just a space of test function. I mean, there is a central limit theorem over the space of test function of co-dimension g. <coughs> so a way to, a physical way to look at that is, imagine you have these lambda i's are eigenvalues of some random Hamiltonians. So you have a random quantum system, and you're probing it by sending some x-ray or whatever. So that you are trying, making measurements amounts to say that you want to compute some linear statistics. And look what it is. And you do the measurements, and you see what are, what are the values of that. So you end up with some points, which at the end will form some, in, some interference pattern. This is just the inverse Fourier transform of this thing. So it's given by this Gaussian plus discrete Gaussian. So this builds some interference patterns for these uh, statistics. OK. So the one-cut regime was first studied for beta equal 2. Um, First, by assuming there is a 1 or an expansion. So for beta equals 2, actually it's an expansion in 1 over n squared. If you assume there is a 1 or an n squared expansion, you can compute the coefficient. Some observation by Ambion, Chekhov, Christians, and Makenko in the 90s, in a pedestrian way. Then, uh, and now we wrote that in a more intrinsic way, geometrically, to compute those uh, coefficients. It's called the topological recursion. and. The advantage of that, it takes a universal form in many different matrix models. It's not particular to, this, to those ones. So that was if you assume there is a one or expansion. The first proof there is a one or expansion in those convergent matrix integrals was done by Albevelio, Passio, and Sherbina. It was by analyzing a uh, Schring and Eisen equation. So there was also another proof because these beta equals two is related to integrable systems. So you have some riemann hilbert techniques which are available. So it was also done by these riemann hilbert techniques by Ecolani and McLaughlin. And also, because you have an integral system, you have some difference, differential equation. And Blair and it's by another method also were able to prove this expansion. Is it stronger result to the Riemann Hilbert method or not? Stronger than what? Stronger than the path um, So the difference in, um, I also, it's not what they are doing here, but the difference with Riemann Hilbert is basically you can do uh, critical points uniformly. Uh, 
Whereas so far, um, also I would like to, we do not know how to do critical points with these string dice and equations. I would say that's the main difference. Yeah, for example. So that was only for BT equals two, where this uses the fact that it's exactly solvable. But from the probabilistic side, I mean, why is something should happen specifically at B equals one, two, and four? It should be something uniform. So for all beta, uh, first, again, if there is a one-way expansion, so now it's no more of one over n squared, um, you can also compute those coefficients. It was done by Chekhov and Ena, and it's called the beta topological recursion. Um, there was a paper of Johansson who proved the central limit theorem for all positive beta, with all approximately the same assumption that the one uh, I presented. And uh, then we proved with Guillonet two years ago the full asymptotic expansion in this one cut case, uh, basically systematizing the approach of um, uh, Pastel, Beverio, Pastor, and Chabi. So now for the multi cut regime. So those oscillations were observed numerically in many different works, especially in physics. Um, I will present a picture at the end. The first result proving such accelerated <coughs> asymptotics, I think, were the results about expectation value of characteristic polynomial obtained by Deft, Christian Boa, and many people using the Riemann Hilbert analysis. So they were seeing those theta function at leading order for all these expectation values. Then there was um, a heuristic derivation, so which was not based on integrability, which was done by Bonnet, David, and Ena, who found again for the same things, uh, the association with theta. Yeah, expectation value of a characteristic polynomial. So here, in terms of lambda i, it's a product. So what kind of a, what kind of a uh, matrix? A random high emission matrix. It's still beta equals 2. Yeah, it's just beta equals 2. Well, to get the something in multi cut regime, um, that's not so obvious oh, to do that. Multi yeah, multi cut. So that's. There was some heuristic derivation of those formula with theta function, and then it was generalized by n r to all orders. So basically, to the formula that I presented you as a result, it was non heuristically before. Uh, and it was the observation by Pasteur that there is no central limit theorem because due to the jumping of eigenvalues from one cut to the to the other, which is again some heuristic argument. So the proof of those results. So the first <laughs> proof was done by Shemina <coughs> one year ago, um, where. She used different technique than the one that we use with Alice. Um, she basically used the fact that when you have several cuts, um, this is, you have some quadratic statistics to compute. And you can use some herbert stratonovich transformation uh, to couple that with the broaden motion, transform that with a linear statistics. And then using some regulative property on the broaden motion, uh, she can conclude up to the uh, decaying terms on the asymptotics in the uh, multi cut regime. But she cannot go further. Um, because of the regularity property of the Brown motion. So um, the theorem I presented before, the general theorem, was something we proved at least this year. Uh, and um, it uses just a probabilistic method and the string Lyson equations. OK. So I want to describe what are the consequences of that if you come back to the exactly solvable cases. Yes. It's, it will be exactly the way we proceed to prove that. We condition, then there's no jumping happening, so there's a one or an expansion. And then you will sum all ways of conditioning, and it will reveal the theta function. Uh -huh. That's the idea. And it's, it's the idea that was behind the heuristic of NR, which just justifies step by step his approach. Sorry? Yes. So you need um, here. Uh, here f is analytic, so you cannot just say the it just cuts off. Yes. Then the result do not apply. So it's a different regime. Yeah. 
Um, I do not know how to see that from trilegonal matrices. Oh, for a case with least to multi-cut. So there was an improvement. So initially, Dimitri and Edelman was for quadratic V. And then there was an improvement, I think, for, ev for any even degree potential. I'm not sure if they asked convex. Um, I think it was for even degree. I must check. If it's for even degree, then yes. There is uh, one of those models. There is a two-diagonal two matrix, which. So, which what does has what should have a uh, almost periodic coefficient? <coughs> the the partition function or uh, the matrix? Okay, that I do not because there are, you see it's it's finer results. It's about some certain entries. Uh, whereas here is something like global on the eigenvalues. So I'm, I'm not sure even if here we have see some sort of periodic that if you could say anything about distribution of those entries. Uh, so I'm, I don't think I know the answer to your question. So for beta equals two, there is a well-known connection to orthogonal polynomials and the total chain. So if you take um, this weight uh, dx exponential minus nv of x on the real line, there is a family of monic orthogonal polynomial. And it turns out it's a formula by Heiner of the last century that um, written in terms of random metric theory, just uh, these orthogonal polynomials, where capital N is my index of the orthogonal polynomial, and small n just the index of this wave. This is given as an expectation value of a characteristic polynomial in these random matrices, uh, capital N times capital N random matrix. Okay. So, from there, uh, if you want to go to the partition function, you need to introduce the, the norms of those, ortho of those orthogonal polynomials for this wave. And if you define the orthonormal polynomials of the p-heads, it's well known to satisfy a three-term recurrence relation. <coughs> and what you can do with this recurrence relation, just look at the recurrence coefficients and define u capital N small n, which is log of h, log of the norms, and v, which is related to minus, which is minus beta, then uh, these things satisfy some difference differential equation with respect to polynomial perturbations of the weight of the potential V. So here is the first, if you add linear perturbations of V, uh, you end up with this equation, which is the equation of the Toda chain. And if you do differential with respect to TK's higher degree perturbations, you would end up with some other uh, nonlinear uh, equations which are compatible with these ones. So it's, it's an integral system. Um, so if you start with for some n, so here n is the size of the matrix. Um, so if you start with some, this tells you how you would evolve when you perturb the potential. And the relation between the, the partition function of this matrix model is what's called the tau function of this, of a, the so associated solution of this Toda chain. And is given by the product of the norms up to a combinatorial factor. So. No, the other equations are exact. exact. Okay. So and then we want to do to study the so continuum those, limit those of them. Like these are the norms, yes. and these are the other other co um, recurrence coefficients over here. It's this one. It just this one is monic. This was is also normal. P hat is also normal. Okay. Okay. So it's the way you define the beta. And that then you get a system. Yes. Okay. And then uh, so how do I get how do I get out of that? How do I get the total? Um well so then it's the relation with um so this can be expanded in the infinite wedge. Uh, I've got the time, the time yeah, the times are the coefficient of the potential. Of the other so yes. So that's okay. where these yeah. equations come from. So what you want to do then is to study the continuum limit of that, which is, <coughs> so here the, you go from n to n minus one, so you want to let n goes to infinity. Uh, in order to have an interesting regime, you need also to scale this n with capital N. Yeah. 
and uh, you take the ratio of that, which is to some value, t, and you, look, you want to know what are the asymptotics of the solutions. So here's a numerical uh, experiment. Uh, So you have multi-t's, but here it's different. You fix the v, and you consider the t varying. Okay, so implicitly, the thing depends on all the other t's, but I will just display it for one variable, which is okay. this, this t. Right. It's right. another a variable. Like that. Yeah. So it's an example that was done by Jokiewicz on the sextic potential. And here's the phase diagram that could be measured in terms of these values of those parameters. If you will scale x, you do not change much the, the topology of the equilibrium measure, so there's a third dimension over here. So this is the full Fermi space. Um, and here, this is the ratio of two Hn, which is plotted. Uh, in terms of, so you choose a certain point in the H and G space over here, so that gives you some value. And then you make this T, which is a capital N or a small n, change, and what you see is some oscillations in some region. But after some point, the oscillations disappear, and here you have some other oscillation patterns. And in the phase diagram, moving this t, I mean, it's rescaling everybody. So if you rescale x, you would just move in, in this phase diagram. And when you are here, it's basically when you cross, you go from three cut to one cut over some line. Vx, the axis, yeah. is g and h. Okay. This h, sorry, this h has nothing to do with the norms. It's just this coefficient over. This is the phase diagram of the equilibrium measure. And here, the axis is t, which is this ratio. And here, the ratio of the norms of two consecutive orthogonal polynomials. So there are some oscillations. So the, the, the general theorem I presented uh, tells that if, so you, you choose some v and you, you make t move. So this defines some equilibrium measure depending on t. Uh, if this is g plus one constant of critical, then the formula I showed you can you can you're allowed to derive all the all the asymptotics of the norms of the orthogonal polynomial because just a ratio of two consecutive partition functions. So you you can describe all those oscillations that are given by some theta functions. You can do the same for orthogonal polynomials because this formula over here that you can write exponential of trace of log of x minus m. It means that you can include it in the potential in this way, minus 1 over n log of x minus something. And if x in the complex plane away from the support, this potential, this new potential, is analytic uh, in the vicinity of the support. So I can apply the results. And again, you can derive the order asymptotics of these orthogonal polynomials away from the support. We cannot do so far in the bulk because we cannot do uh, critical potential. So that uh, can be applied in a similar way for beta equals 1 and 4. It turns out this expectation value of characteristic polynomials are related to what's called the skew orthogonal polynomials. And the integral system behind it that was found by Adler, Van der Beek, and I think Horozov uh, is the Pfaff lattice. So uh, you can uh, derive the similar way that some, all the asymptotics of that. What is the Pfaff lattice? Sorry? The Pfaff lattice is a kind of another type of differential uh, integral system, which is slightly different than this one. So if I remember, um, this is also related. So this is a kind of A version of the total lattice, and the Pfaff lattice is related to the B version, if I remember. Okay. So you can derive similarly these results. And also, in principle, for those, there is a Renan Hilbert formulation. You could do this Renan Hilbert analysis. Uh, it's very technical to do so. I think, to my knowledge, has not been done in literature. So, in this way, you can derive those results. Okay. So, I will try to describe some ideas about the proof of, of that. So, the first thing is um, up to exponentially small correction because you have this control of large deviations. Yes. I will prove those results. Which, which one? That, that one, right? Actually, if I have that one, this one, you did use it. Yeah, no, but you're, but the multi cut you're working with, right? Yeah, I'm working with multi cut. You're working with multi cut, so you get the theta function. Yeah. Really, this applies to the theta function. 
Mm -hmm. from yes. So I will prove this result. I'll show how to arrive to this result. Rather. Okay. The first thing is that you modify the model. Um, because I have this control of large deviation, everything happens close to the support of the equilibrium measure, up to exponentially small correction. So I have my, imagine I start with uh, eigenvalues integrated on R, and my support is somewhere over here, let's say S0, S1, and I integrated my lambda i's initially everywhere. I'm seeing that up to exponentially small correction, the partition function, you can integrate over A0 and A1, which are some neighborhood of the support. And in this way, now I can really speak of what it is to be in this connected component or in this connected component. I can distinguish that. So with this uh, A, which is a distant union of G plus one segments around the connected component of the support, I can <laughs> define the conditioning, which is saying that I take my measure and I fix the number of uh, the first lambdas, I put n year of them in there. I put n one of them in there, and so on. And the sum, it sums up to n. So this, what I would call the fixed filling fraction model. That's what I will study first. And if you want the partition function, you just have to sum all possible ways of split of sharing these eigenvalues. And here, just the ordering factor. So I want to understand that. I will prove it as a Warner expansion, and then I will do a symptotic analysis of that. So the partition function, um, what we really do is not work with the partition function, but it's derivative with respect to coefficient of the potential. So what we really compute first is some expansion for those correlators. So for me, the M point correlator is the um, cumulant under this measure, this fixed filling fraction measure of, if the lambda i is the eigenvalue of some mat diagonal matrix, is the cumulant of observables like this. And xi's are away from my integrations. And if I know that, the way to come back to the partition function is just saying that, imagine that I know this thing as an expansion for a family of potential which respect my assumptions. Then I can just say that um, this ratio of partition function is given by integrating um, this one point correlation function. Just writing that the log derivative of Zn is exactly expect, um, some counter integral of the one point correlation function. So I just need to understand that for a smooth family of potential. I can interpolate. And then if I'm starting with some potential V1, I need to find a V0 for which I know very well that in order to know the asymptotic expansion of V0. So about the correlators. So the way um, we studied them is by schwinger dyson equation. So those equations are general relation whenever you have an integral, uh, given so integral of some measure, uh, you can write an exact relation which relates um, certain expectation where value with respect to this measure, uh, just by expressing the fact that an integral is invariant by reparameterization. Um, so here, the first type of those equations in this model is those ones that you can prove, for example, by integration by part, uh, and you can rewrite it in terms of this correlation function in this way. So here, because of that, uh, you have uh, some quadratic uh, <coughs> statistics. So you have some two-point correlation function, and then W1, and some other things. So this is the first one, is a full hierarchy of them. Uh, you can obtain, by then changing the potential, you can obtain, um, for any n, a relation between Wn plus 1, Wn, et cetera, W1. So these are obtained by integration by part? Yes. Uh, Um, it's, let's say the same. So these equations do not allow you to compute because for example here, imagine you want to compute W1, you need to watch W2 and it's the same. So it's, they're not closed equations, just some relations. And I insist that they're valid what, wherever I put my eigenvalues. So for any number of eigenvalues in each well, it's the same equation. 
which just correspond to different solution of this equation if I change the number of eigenvalues. It does not matter uh, for Schrodinger's dyson equation what the xi's are. It will matter. It will matter when I want. So basically, I'm saying that I will use that, and this equation has many solutions. If I don't know how to specify the solution, there's no way I can solve. Because I fix the number of eigenvalues in each way, I will be able to know which solution of that I'm considering. That's the, that's the trick. OK. So consider that and fix the ratio of the number, I mean, what's the f what I really call the filling fraction does epsilon h, which is the number of eigenvalues you patch in the well h divided by the total number of eigenvalue. So just fix that. So the first thing is, in this condition model, you also have a notion of equilibrium measure. Your maximum is, is energy functional, not over the space of probability measure, but with over the space of probability measure, which has fixed number, which has fixed mass for each of the supports. This is, some, this is a convex condition, so there is still exists a unique maximizer. Um, you act depending on those epsilon. And it just means that if you take x away from the support on this W1, there's a CDS transform of this equilibrium measure. So W1 um, is rescaled by 1 over n converges. What you know from this large deviation estimate that I um, announced before, which were over here, so that everything is close to mu x, you can prove some very rough estimate on the magnitude of those uh, cumulants. And the answer is of this form. W1, if you remove uh, this leading order, it's just of order n log n to the square root. And the n, the m point correlation function is of order n log n to the m over 2. That's what you obtain very roughly. So the important property of schrodinger dyson equation is that they are quite rigid. If you have a solution which satisfies those estimates, you can improve them dramatically by bootstrap, by doing some bootstrap techniques in the, in the schrodinger dyson equations to obtain that this has a limit. And in general, the m-point correlation function behaves at capital N to the 2 minus m. So you go from n log n to the small m over 2, you can improve that automatically to n2 minus n. So that's, I would say, the key step of. So let's say that I'm saying, for example, take the covariance of trace of 1 over x1 minus m trace of 1 over x2 minus m. A priori, you know that this is of order n log n by concentration. I'm saying that by playing with the schrodinger dyson equation, this implies, actually, it's not only that. It's with, if you know that for all m, it implies even for this one, for m equals 2, that this is actually of order 1. You have a very rough bound, and, and you then, improve. Then what, then you use the to, get to, to, uh, to, improve to improve it. it. That's it. So that's the improvement. And once you're there, you can continue improving. So you just have, then there's, there is something. So if you just multiply this by capital N to the M minus 2, this thing has a non-zero limit. OK, so just subtract it and continue. And then you will prove that this WM has a 1 over an expansion, which starts as capital N to the 2 minus N. And the reason why you can do that is basically that because for all the subleading orders, you can, the schrodinger dyson equation determines it because there's a kind of, it can be written as a linear equation. The thing you don't know plus something you know plus something small. So you just have to invert this linear operator. And because you fix the filling fractions, this operator is invertible. It's bounded invertible, invertible and inverse continuous in some topology. Uh, the only thing that you lose is you cannot expect that it's uniform when you want to go farther. 
So all these axes, I said they are away, so you take any compact of the complex plane when you remove the support. Um, then for any fixed k, this is uniform in any such compact, but you cannot, you do not have uniformity in the order k. Okay. So that was, now we have this expansion for the correlation functions. Now you want to come back to the partition functions, again for this fixed filling fraction case. So you have to do that uh, to, you have to find an interpolation which starts from your v to something you know very well. So in the one cut case, you know one situation of one cut case, just the Gaussian potential, where you can compute exactly the beta partition function. It's a Selberg beta integral. But for the multi-cut case, there is no such exactly solvable case. So you have to find something. And the something is to say, actually, it's, so in the one cut case, you could start from V and interpolate with some Gaussian V respecting the assumptions. That can be found. But for multi cut the idea is instead of interpolating the space of potentials, let's interpolate in the space of equilibrium measure. Declare the interpolation the interpol in the equilibrium measure and deduce for which potential does it come. And in this way, you decide what's the measure and it's, 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 more, it's more convenient. And that's the interpolation path we choose so you start with some multi-cut case. Let's do a convex linear combination with semi circles in each well. So you can find a potential which does that because of the correspondence I told you. So you end up with some new potential which produces this semicircle. Of course, this new potential is not a Gaussian in each well because those are interacting. So it's a sum of Gaussian plus some interactions. And now once you're there, just you can squeeze the support uh, here. And in those situations, all the eigenvalues, um, all the interaction are localized here. So here, this partition becomes just a product of Selberg integral. And the interaction between that and that is deterministic. Because it's just the, this product difference here to the power beta, product of all pairs. So in this way, you reduce um, the potential you know very well. It's just a product of Selberg beta for each well once you're just reduced to some points. And you can do that respecting the assumptions. So, what, so when you're doing this, this uh, interpolation, uh, are, you're not changing the measure or what? You're changing the potential. You are changing the potential, so you're changing yeah. the partition function. Yeah, of course. And So what you gain is that here, to obtain that, I just need to integrate the one point correlation function over this path. And for each point in this path, I know this as a one run expansion, okay. which is actually it's uniform. Is it, the, is it to recover the original partition? It's to recover the original partition function. You need one point of comparison. Yeah. So basically, you'd say that apart from the one expansion, this kind of n to the gamma n plus gamma prime, this only comes from the Selberg integrals. So we have an expansion for this partition function for fixed splitting fraction. And now I want to explain how you get to those theta functions. So the first thing is, because everything happens close to the equilibrium measure, we have large deviation estimates. In particular, we have large deviations uh, on the filling fractions. We know that if we restrict the vector of filling fraction to be close to n epsilon star, the expected one, up to of order uh, log of n, then you just make some exponentially small error. OK, so let's do that. Now, what we just proved is that for epsilon close to epsilon star, uh, so there is a small theorem here, is that the equilibrium measure, which depends on epsilon, the one in a fixed filling fraction model. So for epsilon star, this is just the equilibrium measure of the initial model, which has some g plus 1 cuts and is off critical. That's our assumption. I'm saying that you can prove a theorem that for epsilon close to epsilon star, this is still a g plus 1 cut of off critical. And it depends smoothly on this epsilon close to epsilon star. Okay. So, in particular, if that is of order log of n, when you divide by n, this is some neighborhood of epsilon star. So our theorem applies to all those things. So we have such an expansion. And as I say, the equilibrium measure is uh, 
a smooth function of epsilon, that's a lemma you have to prove. Um, and all these f's, these ex coefficient of expansion, uh, they are, can be computed in terms of mu ec, epsilon. So they also are smooth function of epsilon. And because epsilon star is really the global maximizer of all possible filling fractions, uh, you can also prove that, I mean, since it it's a global maximum, um, the Hessian is definitely negative. So here it's the Hessian of the energy functional of mu ec respect to the filling fraction epsilon. And this is definitely negative. So when you, once you have that, you can just, when you want to sum here, just sum Taylor expansion and control the error. So let's do that up to order one. So I have this sum of my restricted things of this quadratic thing plus the thing coming from the first correction. There is no linear, there is no f minus two prime because we are at the maximum, we are at the maximum. There's no linear term here. Plus some errors, so here you would have cubic terms and cubic terms you can bound it by this log of n. Cube divided by n, so it's something which is exponentially small. And here, now you recognize something which is this is definite negative, so it's an exponentially fast converging series. It's a general term of exponentially fast converging series. So you can add all the other terms by summing over the full lattice, but you would just do some exponentially small um, corrections if you do that, which is done of order exponential minus c log of n squared. And here, you recognize sum of exponential of a quadratic form, which is a theta function. So that does the leading order. If you want to do the subleading order, so you go further in the expansion over here, you would have some higher powers of um, vector n minus n epsilon star. So you would have to, you would encounter some terms like this. This you can just reproduce by differentiating the theta function with respect to this variable w to make appear these things as a factor. So you can write it this way. So that's the origin of the, of the form and you see that this q was the Hessian of this energy functional and W is the first correction to the free energy at epsilon star. So that's the way this heuristic was found by Bonnet, David, and Enard, and we justified it, so that's the final result. Um, so all these interferences come from these eigenvalues jumping from one to another, and the fact that we have, if we conditioned, um, the coefficients depend smoothly on that. Okay. So, now that you have these results, what can we do? <coughs> the first thing, and that's something we are uh, finishing now with Gunn and Koslovsky, is to say that these results uh, should give, I would say, a, a basic theory to study asymptotics of multidimensional integrals. It's not specially related to the fact that you only have a von Neumann. Imagine you have a von Neumann and you have, to have some smooth k-body interaction. And or for convenience say that the order of interaction is bounded, so you just have k uh, r uh, body interactions. But you could probably do something in, uh, with more things in doing uh, topology in uh, infinite number of variables. So imagine you have that, and again, I assume that tk's are real analytic near the support of my equilibrium measure. Um, then the same type of results hold. For that, you have to take some natural assumptions. So first, I was saying before, the energy functional was strictly convex, it was just a quadratic one, so it's very easy to compute. Uh, now we have the energy functional is something like this, which is R linear. Uh, it's not at all clear uh, if it's convex or not, so it's just an assumption you make. You make an assumption that this has a unique minimum, which I call equilibrium measure. Uh, then, to have some global large deviations, so to say that um, the probability that uh, the distance between the empirical measure and the equilibrium measure is bigger than T is smaller than some exponential of, say, C n log n minus n squared t squared. To have that, and to have these Ross control and correlators, you need basically that this is strictly convex locally at the mu ec, as a function over the space of probability measures. Um, if you have that, basically you obtain a similar asymptotic result. And um, some, I've not said anything about computing the coefficient of expansion. But um, what I can say now, just very quickly, is that this coefficient of expansion can be computed still by the same beta topological recursion. Uh, it just, you change the initial data. Um, that's true for uh, when you have only pairwise interactions. When you add some k-linear interactions, 
you have a slight modification of the, this topological recursion, uh, which I call the blob topological recursion. So here um, I prove that if there is a one or expansion that now we are justified with Gunn and Kostovsky, it's the coefficients are given by this blob topological recursion. So we know also, uh, if you know the equilibrium measure, you know how to compute that. Knowing the equilibrium measure, of course, here computing explicitly is very complicated. <coughs> okay. So to summarize the general idea of uh, those results is when the support is connected, you have a one or expansion. When you have gaps, you have some interference patterns. Uh, which are given by theta function and uh, also in riemann hubert the theta function uh, comes from you really want to construct some meromorphic function on some compact Riemann surface given by an analytic continuation of the equilibrium measure here the origin of the theta function is very different it seems to be much more universal um, even though you do not have algebraic geometry basically you have the theta function just describe some interferences when you have n squared degrees of freedom um, and the other thing we observe is when you compute, when you solve these triangulation equations, uh, the only thing which really dictates the coefficients, um, the structure of this expansion, is the singularities of this measure. So if you were considering some other type of singularities, that would probably change the nature of the expansion. Or this topological recursion will not be true, or some modification, it would have to be modified. Can you change one of the yes. So as I say, here it can contain some two-point correlation functions. So that could be any function r of lambda i lambda j, which behave at short scales like lambda i minus lambda j to the beta. So what you, if you change the type of singularities of that, then the nature of the expansion uh, should be different. Imagine that you, consi imagine that you consider um, yeah, something which could be something like that. Uh, you do not see here. Some other type of singularity or some three-body singularity, um, something which vanishes when three points come together. Then that would probably be different. Um, so to finish, I just want to state some open I would say interesting problems. And although there are sometimes some methods to, to study them, what I would really like is to be able to do that with Schrodinger's equations because it does not rely on any exactly solvable uh, things. So uh, the first thing would be to be able to do critical points. Um, so this thing, this bootstrap here, this operator basically, it starts to have a kernel when you have some, um, when you are at a critical point. It means that the kernel is finite dimensional, so you just need to specify some extra condition. So it's not clear yet if you can have rough estimate on those extra conditions by probability to put that in the equations. That's something we start to work on. So can we describe singular potential? And that would, for example, allow to do asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials in the bulk, of skew orthogonal polynomials in the bulk. Um, which, uh, say, for skew orthogonal polynomial, it's something which is very difficult a priori for by Riemann Hilbert, also possible. Um, so, the initial motivation of that actually was to justify some computation uh, we did heuristically um, with this topological recursion for the tails of Tracy Widom distribution. The Tracy Widom beta distribution is the dis limit law of the fluctuation of the maximum eigenvalues of a random matrix, of a beta random matrix. And for that, um, so for beta equals 1 to 4, there are formulas in terms of Panelvé. There is a very nice theory. For general beta, there are some characterization in terms of some diffusion operator. But to compute something about that, uh, it's not that convenient. So what we were saying, it was in something with uh, Madrumdar, Enar, and Nadal. We were saying that if you do large deviations, uh, so probability that the expected eigenvalue is far away from expected maximum, there is a one, this has a one-order expansion. And then if you just plug in so not so large deviations, there's a crossover to a double scaling limit. And of course you have to justify the crossover is valid uh, rigorously, and that's difficult. So if we can do some uniform synthetic and critical point, we'll be able to justify that there is indeed this crossover. And then Actually, you can really compute those coefficients of the tails from these large deviations, and that would prove this um, all other asymptotic expansion of the tail of Tracy Widom beta. So that's the initial motivation. We just start to be um, working on this problem. 
the other type of thing we would like is, so I showed that this exponential fluctuation of linear statistics, um, you, this Fourier transform, so Fourier transform of um, fluctuation of linear statistics, uh, is something Gaussian plus something which is a theta function. Um, so if you would like to do some uh, Bayesian type estimate for this central limit theorem, or even in one cut case, uh, what you would need is to study S, which is large, which scales with N. And which means that basically you would have to be able to do potential, which contains a complex part, which is not of order 1 over N, but something bigger. And that we do not know how to do for the moment. So that would give you some finer, probably, estimates on those things. Um, you can ask the same question about two dimension. Uh, I would say that's fairly open, uh, if you can do the same type of thing. And another, I would say, interesting problem is to do the same thing for multi-matrix model, in particular because there you have, um, so almost nothing is known about asymptotics of bi-orthogonal polynomial related to the two-matrix model or the chain of matrices. And so that's, I would say, an important uh, problem that one may hope to be able to tackle from the probabilistic side and not from the integral system side. Okay, thanks for your attention.